Okay, welcome back to section 5.1. We're going to do a few more examples of conjunction elimination, conjunction introduction, and material elimination and the material conditional introduction. So there's, uh, yeah, let's go to another example. So um, I'm, I'm, I've changed my mind, uh, apologies if this is confusing, but uh, I've changed my mind to not mean anything by the colors. Uh, I'm just going to keep using them differently because I think, you know, they look pretty. Uh, so the fact that I'm using blue now doesn't doesn't mean anything different. Uh, we'll just keep them more interesting. And whenever I do use meta variables, I'm going to continue to use that sort of those two lines to indicate the bold face. Okay, so suppose we have this time uh, we have our primary assumptions are if b then uh, F, and we also have another assumption that says uh, if F, then uh, D, and we also have, um, let's say R. Okay. And these assumptions up here, so the ones we start out with, these are actually called the primary assumptions. So maybe I'll put that here. These are called our primary assumptions. And the reason why they're called the primary assumptions is because we are going to be making use of further assumptions later on and those will be called auxiliary assumptions, and we'll introduce those in due time. Okay, now suppose that my, the goal, right, so what I want to derive is, let's, hopefully this fits on here, I want to derive R and D. That's my goal, right, so I want to derive this. Okay, so I know already I have R, but in order to get D, I need to, I, I want to use conjunction introduction, but I first need to get D somewhere here. And I notice, well, we're going to think backwards a little bit, that D is found here in the material conditional, the, this consequent of the material conditional, uh, and F is the consequent. And here, F is the consequent of this other material conditional, B. And so, uh, I actually just realized that this proof won't actually work, so ahead of time. But we'll we'll see why. So this will actually be instructive for why we won't actually be able to get um, R and D, at least not on on the outside uh, scope line. And oh, I can't remember if I, I mentioned this before or not, but this outside line here, this is called the scope line. So that's our scope line. I can't write very small on this whiteboard here. So that's called the scope line. That should be a C. Okay. So the first thing we know, uh, uh, let me see how I should put this. Yeah, okay. So let me actually quickly just change the example here because I know already that this won't work. But uh, there is another thing that we can actually derive, which is, uh, so this is, oh, sorry. This is what we're going to try to derive. We're going to try to derive if B, then R and D. Okay. So given that this is what we want to derive, or maybe I'll just make that very clear by writing this. Uh, we notice that the main connective of the, the thing that we want to derive is a material conditional. So that means we're going to have to do a conditional proof, right? So if we want our, in our last line, if we, oh, shoot, I guess you can't really see that. So in our, in the last line, what we want is, OK, 
Yeah, you guys can still see that. It should still be in the screen. If we want this, this material conditional, then what we need is a conditional proof. And remember, the way we did the conditional proof is by introducing uh, another scope line, and we're going to make uh, another assumption. And our assumption is going to be B, right? So we're going to assume the antecedent, and we're going to tr try to derive R and D. Okay, so that's what we're going to hope. That's what we're going to hope to derive. So you'll notice already that by assuming B, we can actually get F out up here, right? So by assuming B, we can get F because we already have that as our assumption. And actually, whenever we make an assumption, uh, we usually write to the right. We write assumption, and we'll just put a little dot there. Uh, as an abbreviation. Okay, so we've made an assumption, and then we can use conjunction elimination to get F. And so we get that by con uh, conditional, sorry, conditional elimination using lines, and I should actually number these lines. So this is one, this is line two, this is line three, this is line four, and now we're on line five. So we did uh, conditional elimination. We did that from rule uh, one, sorry. We did that from rule one and from four. Okay, and now that we have F, we know that we can also get D, right, because we can use the same rule again, conditional elimination. So at line 6, we can write D, and we get that again by conditional elimination. From lines 2 and 5. And now we're going to have everything we need to get R and D, right, because uh, we have R on line 3, and we have uh, R, D on line 6, and so we can actually do conjunction introduction. But there's a really important rule here that I should, uh, I should mention. So if conjunction introduction from line 3 and 6. Okay, and... Let me say a little bit before I say anything about the conclusion, why we were able to do this, even though R was not in this scope. So it's really important, so there's this notion of what's called accessibility. And you're, you aren't always allowed to access uh, any given sentence uh, if it's outside of the scope. So scopes get embedded. So in other words, right here, uh, this scope line, is within this the main scope line here that we have up here. And whenever you're further in, uh, whenever you have some scope line, you are allowed to take anything um, from the greater scope line uh, that's outside of you. So in other words, those other sentences are accessible to you. But you can't go, so suppose we have this last line here, and let me erase this. I am not allowed to write anything here uh, that comes from inside the scope line. In other words, the sentences that are in here are not accessible from this outside scope line. So I can't do, for example, I can't go uh, F and D. Uh, that's bad. And the reason why that's bad is because, let me just write that, that's bad. So the reason why we can't do that is because we are outside of the scope uh, line of this subderivation. So we can't actually do this, so I'm going to erase this right away. So remember, 
you're only allowed to, uh, the only sentences that are accessible to you are what the sentences that are currently in your uh, scope line and sentences that are in the outside scope line of your assumption. And actually, and this can be iterated. So sometimes we might even have an assumption with inside an assumption, and that's okay as well. You can keep going out, but you can't look into a scope line to go to grab a sentence letter. You always have to be looking out, right? So you have to be going into the um, uh, uh, the main scope line or the, the outer scope line. Okay, so now let's finish this derivation, right? We want it to derive if B then R and D. So our last line here is going to be line eight. And we're discharging uh, this assumption. And by the rule of material introduction, we can now get if B then R and D. And we get that by conditional introduction from lines. And here this is a little bit different now. Um, we actually have to appeal to the whole, uh, we start with the assumption and we get it from the all the all the lines that are within the scope of that assumption. So all the way down to seven. So we say that we get that from four, from lines four to line seven. And that's it. Now we've completed our derivation.